Yes, everyone, these are the proverbial sirens going off, off in the tiny cloistered world of dinosaur studies and enthusiasm. I am CM Kozeman in a short new podcast to review this groundbreaking new hypothesis of dinosaur relationships and its implica- implications. Obviously, if you're interested in dinosaurs, by now you must have definitely heard about this groundbreaking new study. It's by Matthew G. Baron, David Norman and Paul Barrett. Hi guys, uh, if you're listening. Uh, this is a major game changer in dinosaur studies. I mean, new ways to classify dinosaurs have been classi- have been proposed before, but this one is really extreme, not only in its proposal, but also in how it has been seemingly supported by a lot of data. Certainly, I mean, there have been many such theories before, but this is the first such theory that's been published in a journal as esteemed as nature. So to the lay person, if a theory like this is published and verified and peer reviewed on a journal like nature, it almost becomes paleontological or scientific canon, you know, so. But as I told before, there has been such theories before. Now, before reviewing them, let me tell you about this new theory. So, and I'm going to tell it uh, in terms of a complete uh, average everybody. I mean, the rule I have with these kind of presentations is if that my brother or, I don't know, like a basic girl of high street, if they can understand it, then I think I'm doing a good job. So, okay, dinosaurs have been traditionally classified uh, in three-ish major groups, okay? There are the theropods, which are the two-legged meat-eating dinosaurs that were the ancestors of birds. Now, for our studies, for our perspective, an early lineage of theropods known as the herarasaurs were almost as almost always assumed to be ancestors of later more bird-like theropods, but we'll get there. That was one group. The second group are the sauropods, which are the again traditional Brontosaurus type, long-necked, plant-eating dinosaurs, which are almost like pop culture icons. When someone thinks of a dinosaur, they either think of a sauropod or I think a T-Rex. But they were actually really weird. Their necks, their feet, their bodies were perforated by air sacs. So they are a very unusual group if you look at them closely. And thirdly, we have another group, the ornithopods or uh, the ornithischians, which are the other plant-eating dinosaurs, including the stegosaurs, the horn-faced ceratopsians, the little bipedal plant-eating herbivores or things like iguanodon. Basically, if it was a plant-eating dinosaur and if it was not a long-necked sauropod, it was an ornithopod or an ornithischian. Now, these two, these three groups traditionally were classified in two big branches of the dinosaur family tree. The theropods and the sauropods were on one branch, which was classified as the lizard-hipped or saurischian dinosaurs, and the ornithopods, the other plant eaters, were an offshot branch that diverged earlier. And these guys were classified as the ornithischians, the bird-hipped ones. The lizard-bird-hip things here are very confusing because actually the real-world birds descended from the lizard-hipped dinosaurs. So there's a bit of confusion there, but I hope you got the clear picture. Now this was the this was the accepted view of major dinosaur classification for the past 130 years. Now there have been alternative theories before. For example, Robert Becker and Paul Serono, these are paleontologists, they proposed that all plant-eating dinosaurs, the long necks and the horn faces and all those, 
kind of play together and were in in fact one big group of plant eaters called Phytodinosauria, the plant dinosaurs, and the meat eaters were another branch. Now, this hypothesis was not supported by data, and most people assume it to be false. Now, the, here is the groundbreaking part. This recent study focused not on the later, more established forms of the dinosaurs, all the all lineages, but they considered nearly 70 species of very early forms of dinosaurs. Now, before they established themselves and grew huge and freaky, dinosaurs started out as small animals. And the ancestors of all three branches, early theropods, early sauropods, and early ornithopods, looked kind of similar. Ornithopods came from a more like plant-eating, two-legged thing, which had actually heterodont dentition, which means that its teeth had two different forms for like cropping and some more sharp teeth and then some more plant grinding teeth. But anyways, this was the ornithopod ancestor. Theropods descended from more things like small, slightly more crocodile-like and again meat-eating forms. And sauropods, the long-necked plant eaters, were thought to have descended from, once again, small, two-legged, not four, that's interesting, and omnivorous, which is, which means things that ate both animals and plants, <laughs> these kinds of things. Now, if you look at them, all these early forms were somewhat familiar, similar, and for good reason, of course, they all came from a common ancestor. So the researchers in this new groundbreaking study looked at all these early forms and in the last decade or so there have been some more early species because the fossil record previously was kind of scant, okay? They uncovered a very unusual pattern. They realized that the early meat-eating dinosaurs and the early ornithopod dinosaurs were actually in the study cousins which is very interesting and the sauropods the long-necked plant eaters were a kind of bastard lineage that didn't directly relate to the other dinosaurs except for the herarasaurs which i mentioned earlier they were thought to be early meat-eating dinosaurs proper but it turns out in this study that the herarasaurs were actually early sauropods so before they became quadrupedal and plant-eating and long-necked it turns out in this study that the big brontosaur things had small meat-eaters as their cousins which is really strange i mean if you are in the know, you know, if you're interested in dinosaurs, if you know this thing, this is a big shock because it's as big a revelation as suddenly realizing that, I don't know, like birds and cats were more related to each other than cats were to dogs or something like this, you know, like a really big uh, revelation. So everyone's going crazy about this online. In the internet, this has even acquired its own strange nickname. They call it the bee fucking of dinosaurs. And it's really thought-provoking. Now, as far as the common data indicates, it seems that this study is really correct. But there are some big question marks. For example, the meat-eating dinosaurs, you know, Velociraptor, T-Rex, whatever, and the long necks, you know, Diplodocus, things like this, have a common pneumaticity in their skeletons, which means they, are, they were perforated by air sacs. Now, pneumaticity seems to be absent from the ornithopod plant eaters, which in this study 
are supposed to be the cousins of the meat eaters which had these air sacs so what happened here i mean it's uh, darren nash pointed this out actually so the ornithopods are now cousins to theropods but they're sandwiched between two groups that had these air sacs did they lose them for some reason or perhaps we're not looking hard enough they may have had them and we haven't realized because air sacs don't fossilize so that's one fly in the ointment and that's one thing that this new theory seems to have difficulty explaining but once again it's a really groundbreaking study and if supported by future research it might change our picture of dinosaur relationships altogether mind you this is a great review i won't deny this but ultimately it's the shifting and juggling of one base branch of the tree at a stage where all these animals were already closely related so even though the implications are big one could argue that they were all quite similar at the early stages of the evolution so it shouldn't be a surprise but here we come to the interesting part and here our knowledge of pterosaurs the flying reptiles also comes into the picture so one of the most interesting takeaways from this study and you know this thing could be i mean this study could be falsified in the future i don't know maybe i think i know that as we speak now it's late march 2017 some people i am sure are preparing a kind of scientific rebuttal to this already like come on man prepare your family trees we're gonna fight back or something like this but anyways regardless of its ultimate survival this theory points out to some very interesting facts about early dinosaurs it seems that all early dinosaurs had some sort of heterodont dentition which means they actually didn't have reptile like teeth they had actually quite advanced one might even argue slightly mammal like teeth that had been adapted for an omnivorous diet so that's a very nice tidbit there and who else had early heterodont dentition the flying reptiles the pterosaurs if you look at the earliest pterosaurs like eudimorphodon or priondactylus they have like a slightly similar dentition to the earliest sauropods the theropods all those guys so that's very interesting and this got me thinking actually when the study first came out i couldn't sleep that night because it seems that all these ruling animals flying reptiles dinosaurs plant-eating dinosaurs meat-eating dinosaurs even birds ultimately descended from one lineage of small climbing animals with heterodont teeth which means differently shaped omnivorous teeth and this animal seems to be a small climbing thing a bit like a crocodilian rat i think and it was probably insulated in some sort of fur or fuzz or reptile feather ancestor thing okay which is also very interesting so we're looking at a small very adaptable active and possibly smart animal as the ultimate ancestor of all these giant and small and flying and ground-based animals that would later dominate the planet for 180 million years the ultimate organism if the great extinction hadn't struck we probably would have dinosaurs around now i'm, I'm almost certain so this got me really excited and i spent the last two days painting and refining and researching this ultimate ancestor and you're seeing it already this is what i think this animal might have looked like so there guys quite out of the blue an amazing new theory 
even when it's just classification, it can teach us and give us a lot of revealing insights about animal ancestry. I mean, it seems that the earliest dinosaurs looked contextually, at least, resembled the earliest mammals a lot. We're talking about active, possibly climbing. It's like as close to a tree shrew as these animals could get. Now, after the dinosaur extinction, there was another animal like this, a tree shrew type animal. And that animal diversified and it gave rise to the anteaters, the elephants, the horses, and anything. So it's really fascinating. It shows that there seems to be the small climbing, smart, adaptable body plan, which when confronted with a vacant niche, ultimately blossoms into globe-dominating arrays of fauna whenever the opportunity presents itself. So when we're thinking about future extinctions and future survival or future blossoming of new lineages, future evolution, it could be interesting. You could derive a lot from a common, smart, omnivorous, climbing ancestor. Amazing how life rhymes like this, you know. So yeah, those are my thoughts and this is my picture. It's CM Kozeman and I'm happily surprised by this new research. It goes to show what a weird and wonderful sh show of information and understanding sciences. Have a nice day, everyone.